to start again. Hello, this is Brent Field, Supervising Librarian at Galita Valley Library. Welcome to the final event in our Book to Action program. The They Called Us Enemy is the book we've read by George Tokay. Uh, today we are having Dr. Kent Halden. He's going to speak about the baseball at the Gila Relocation Center. Uh, Dr. Halden is uh, currently the a history professor at the Diablo Valley College, right? He is a PhD from Berkeley with three masters in history, English, and education. We're very happy to have him, and we're fortunate to have him talk about the Gila Relocation Center baseball there. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kent Halden. Thank you, Dr. Halden, for joining us today. Hi there. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, I'm Ken Halden. This is my technical mm -hmm. assistant, uh, Hi there. Grant Pate. And uh, here we go. I um, this was my dissertation at Cal, mm -hmm. and in the late '90s, I t I went to a American Historical Association conference. And I talked to um, Roger Daniels, uh, who's like the foremost Japanese American historian, uh, mm -hmm. you know, up until like the 90s. And he was the editor of University of Illinois Press. And he said, you know, I asked him if he'd be interested in publishing my dissertation. And he said, sure. You know, cut, basically cut. It was at that time, it was 550 pages. And he said, mm -hmm. cut 125 pages and submit it. So I submitted it to him. He says, well, great. Uh, we really want to publish it, cut another 100 pages, and then add as much as you can about baseball. Well, for me, that's, mm. that was mission impossible. Just to mm. let you know. <laughs> um, it was mission impossible. So mm. I, I eventually put that on the back burner, and I went to teach, and, and I taught East Asian history, U.S. history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when Carrie offered me this opportunity to present my uh, book again, I said, okay, let me rethink it a little bit. So like the way it's laid out is like the first five chapters deal with the history of Japanese Americans in Santa Maria Valley and Santa mm -hmm. Barbara. Mm -hmm. Then I had a whole thing on labor relations on Kerry McWilliams, how like mm -hmm. they, we had the best labor relations uh, in Santa Maria Valley in California during the Great Depression. Filipinos, they all went along with the New Deal and it was because of the Japanese uh, mm -hmm. ownership of the large produce companies. So that was really key. And then I had an anti-Japanese movement uh, section. And then I had the internment camp. Well, this this mm -hmm. project now has forced me to kind of like look at the camp and then backtrack. You know, instead of doing mm -hmm. it to the camp, it forced me to kind of look back and see what the pre-World uh, War II history, how that impacted the camp experience for Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. Okay, now how do I... Get my uh, so I want to get the slideshow up and running. So and she's going to do it for us. Oh, okay. They're going to do it for us. So we're ready to go. We're ready to go. Show the presentation. Okay, thanks. Let me just get the slides up, guys. There we go. Okay, great. Uh, so the cursor. The cursor. I'll move it for you. We've been having technical problems. Just to let you know, the uh, UBS port on my laptop hasn't been working properly, so I may or may not be able to use the cursor. You're good to go. Okay, so the title of my book is Where East and West Meet in California, Three Japanese American Communities in Santa Barbara County. There are actually four, and um, John uh, McReynolds uh, did Lompoc. It has a wonderful book out on Lompoc. I really recommend that you read that. Uh, uh, it's really worthwhile. It's called Vanished because the people that lived in Lompoc before the war uh, did not come back. Only a couple of families came back, unfortunately. Now, the title of this today's lecture is uh, Baseball in the Gila Relocation Center. Um, now, this title, also the title above that, Kenichi Zenimura's Field of Greens of Dreams. This comes from, um, from Karen uh, Nakagawa's excellent book, and he, he so I'm using his uh, title uh, because I think it's really in, in, interesting. And Zenny Moore is a very important character in Japanese American baseball. He was the one who uh, 
made it possible for uh, Babe Ruth and um, Lou Gehrig to go to Japan in the early 30s and play a series of games that made baseball incredibly popular in Japan. So today's lecture uh, uh, examines the role baseball played in the Gila Relocation Center, uh, which this, the uh, in the excellent scholar who wrote this wonderful book, Brian Hayashi, Democratizing the Enemy, the Japanese American Interment. He doesn't look at baseball at all, but he writes an excellent book looking at the politics in three of the camps, which I will, will discuss in a second. One of the camps was Poston, one was Manzanar, and then one was uh, Topaz. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, I argue that it should be taken seriously because it provided a kind of alternative reality to cope with the limits imposed by mainstream society that pitted Japanese Americans against other groups and took, and took away their uh, constitutional rights during World War II. Moreover, the Issei, so Ichi Ni San, so first generation is Issei, Nisei, second generation, and Kibei, and those are the Niseis who were educated in Japan, brought with them a huge resource when they were interned, their rich pre-war social life, which was immersed in baseball and sports, as well as their social activities, which were usually centered around the Buddhist and Christian churches. It was a world in which they actively participated. And that's, that's one of the central themes here. You know, today we live in this very polarized world. Well, this is, this is where people didn't just watch sports. They participated in them. And as individuals, they were bicultural, having been immersed to varying degrees in both uh, American and Japanese culture. In 1942, Japanese Americans in Santa Barbara County were uprooted from their homes and interned. Uh, in April, most Japanese Americans from Santa Barbara were sent to Tulare Assembly Center, where they comprised a third of its population. And there's, uh, here's the, and these were race tracks, and so they were people had to live in horse stalls. Uh, in addition to their resentment over the terrible conditions, the most contentious issue in these centers was the promotion of Nisei over Issei into leadership positions. And one of the things, and we're going to talk about the War Relocation Authority, which became in charge of all the, of most of these internment camps. There were 10 internment camps. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Uh, <clears throat> in 1942, the uh, army issued an order forbidding the Issei from holding office or voting for uh, councilmen and advisory committee members. Now, this is very important because, of course, the Japanese culture, I mean, we know that it is patriarchal, just like our American culture is, but this really upset the, uh, you know, the power relations in the Japanese American community. And one of the things, uh, and this is partly for legal reasons, because there's an issue of like, you know, the Issei's were not American citizens. They couldn't become American citizens. So there's an issue of uh, state versus federal um, status of, of the Issei's. So they decided, well, we're just not going to let them become uh, part of the governing structure. Now that changes and we will see. Then in September, they were transferred to Gila Relocation Center where they made up about 15% of the population. The first center was uh, managed by the US Army, the second by the War Relocation Authority. And they handled uh, most of the, the, uh, the uh, internment camps. There were 10 internment camps. And here we go. After a brief stay in the assembly centers, about 80 to 85,000 evacuees were herded into 171 special trains and taken to these following uh, places. So one is uh, Topaz, which uh, uh, Brian Hayashi deals with. Topaz, he deals with Poston. I deal with uh, Gila. And then um, Manzanar. And then Tule Lake. Manzanar, both of these are in California. Uh, Manzanar is in the Owens Valley, and that's where people from L.A. were, were sent. And then uh, Tule Lake is became the, the, the center for the, quote, troublemakers. That's the WRA's turn, not mine. So they were thrown into uh, Tule Lake in Northern California. You can see that there, there's Tule Lake, there's uh, Manzanar in the Owens Valley, and Poston and Gila in uh, Arizona, and then Topaz in uh, in uh, Utah. So Topaz in Utah was where people were sent from uh, the Bay Area. Poston was where people were sent from Central 
uh, this California Central Valley. Manzanar, where people were sent from uh, L.A. And Hayashi, in his, this brilliant book, but it's very difficult to read, I have to tell you that, uh, in his brilliant book, Democratizing the Enemy, he's really making the point that this was an experiment in kind of social engineering, that the people that ran these camps really wanted to study the Japanese and see what makes them tick. But not only that, but also to, you know, make them into perfect um, citizens. So Hayashi says self-government federal government officials felt was the key to governing the intern uh, Japanese population, his words. However, he shows that uh, these officials were going to rig the outcome by choosing the Japanese American leaders. He quotes an anonymous, and this is the uh, this is before the WRA, the War Relocation Authority, was set up. This is called the uh, War Civilian Control Administration. Anyway, so in this early pre-WRA uh, organization, which would, uh, would govern most of the, the uh, camps, uh, one of the officials said, and, and these are his words, the Japs are going to have a regular government, a council, judges, juries, their own police, and all the rest of it. As soon as we pick the leaders... After all, we can't trust them to do that themselves, or they would likely elect the wrong type of men. Now, notice that. I mean, definitely uh, a very condescending perspective. Anyway, the people from Santa Barbara were taken to Gila River Relocation Center. Um, and, and this uh, Gila was divided into two camps, Canal and Butte, the, the latter surrounded by low mountain ranges. And let's, you can kind of see it there. Uh, I have to apologize being being so verbal. I have a lot of text here, but I'm an English teacher and I do rely on text. And, and you know, looking at language is very important to me. Uh, so anyway, so I, I've got a better, well, okay, here's a, here's a diagram and you can see, let's see if I can get this thing to work. You can see the Butte camp there and then the canal camp. Um, so about, um, the Butte camp was still under construction when the people from Santa Barbara arrived. Uh, Japanese Americans from Santa Maria, uh, when they arrived, uh, they saw this death storm coming up. They rushed to close the windows and doors, but to no avail. The inside of the barracks uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> to close the do uh, windows and the doors, but to no avail. The inside of the barracks was soon enveloped in dust. They felt like they'd been shoved into hell, as George Aratani relates. And this is the camp. You, you have a diagram of the camp. You see how it's laid out. This picture better shows. You know, it's all very uniform barracks. Uh, not a particularly nice place to live. The camps were linear. Their barracks lined in orderly rows. Bob wire fences with guard towers determined space for the uh, internees. Some tried to provide an alternative to the structures the new form of necessity by creating rock gardens with bonsai uh, outside their drab barracks. Their little gardens provided relief in a world of military-like discipline. And here, here's one of these rock gardens. This is, you know, obviously way after the war. Um, this is an effort to recreate a world uh, that they knew before the war. Meanwhile, despite their exclusion from the elective office, the Issei's dominated politics in the Hilo relocation center. In both camps, the uh, community councils in which only the, the Nisei could hold office were essentially powerless without the Issei support. The Nisei councilmen very quickly found that the Issei dominated the uh, block councils, and they were, which were much more powerful. And they represented, and because they were, uh, they represented and had the support of most of the interned evacuee population. So, they created, the Issei's created the Kowakai, the Peace Society. A considerable number of Issei continued to be dissatisfied with the conditions in Gila Center, uh, they were, and that they were excluded from office. Some Issei leaders from the Santa Maria Valley, and I, I, this is something I should say, most of the Santa Barbara Issei's were there, but in Santa Maria on February 19th and 20th, all the Issei's were arrested and taken uh, and eventually ended up in um, Bismarck, North Dakota, in a Department of Justice camp. And this would be a big issue for the Issei uh, JCL. And I'll talk about all that when I get there to the JCL. 
Okay, the uh, WRA finally in May 1943 acquiesced and allowed the Issei to hold office. Uh, but this uh, Kyo Wakai represented kind of continuing Issei struggle for representation. So like I said, uh, Dylan Meyer was the director of the WRA, very, you know, he was the boss. And he issued an order re very reluctantly letting the uh, Issei hold office. Uh, okay, during, so we had to backtrack. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Japanese American Citizens League which is a very cont controversial uh, organization, particularly during the internment. During the evacuation, the National Japanese American Citizens League cooperated closely with the Army and the War Relocation Authorities with 100% 100 su 100 support for the military effort. And one of the leaders, uh, Mike Masaoka, went to, you know, uh, petition or, or uh, sent a letter to uh, President uh, Roosevelt saying we want to form suicide squads. And this really upset people, you know, put us in the front line. We want to fight this war and prove that we're, you know, 100% uh, uh, American citizens. And they tried to distance themselves from the Issei, particularly the ones who had been arrested. Uh, so the JCL actions incurred the wrath of many Issei, Kibe, and Nisei who felt that they'd been betrayed. Some blamed the national JCL leaders for the arrest of local of uh, Issei leaders, feeling that these leaders had turned them into the authorities, and and the J JCL uh, made no bones about it that they were going to turn over people they thought were suspicious, and that that created a lot of tension. Now in the Gila Center, the JCL, JCL as well as the Santa Maria Nisei uh, leadership took a middle course between cooperating with the War Relocation Authority and resisting its more repressive uh, or oppressive policies and pushing for a steady return to California. Unlike the national JCL leaders, these leaders were much more concerned about protecting the civil liberties and property rights of Japanese Americans and advocating some of the more uh, 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 pressing concerns of the Issei, especially those Issei males who had been arrested in mass uh, in Santa Maria Valley in Feb uh, February 1942 and then were sent to Bismarck, North Dakota. During the registration crisis in February 1943, however, the Guadalupe, I'm sorry, the Gila JCL, because of its association with the national uh, JCL, was discredited and forced to disband. They actually organized and had about 700 uh, members, but there was, when the tide turned against them because of the national uh, leadership, uh, they had to disband, uh, you know, disband and, you know, the 700 people went their merry way. However, the uh, Gila JCL donated $1,000, and this is very important to the national JCL, to fight for Nisei rights immediately, and the latter created a civil rights committee, so they did have some impact on the leadership. But when they asked to, you know, about the, um, the you know, the Issei's that were interned and, you uh, uh, in, in North Dakota, in Bismarck, the National JCL didn't want to have anything to do with those guys because they were under suspicion. Uh, the second conflict, the loyalty questions. On February 8, 1943, the male citizens were ordered to appear and fill out a questionnaire on February 11th. The uh, WRA gave them a questionnaire entitled the application for leave clearance. And if the respondent answered the questions correctly, in, in other words, said yes, yes, to questions 27 and 28, which we'll see in just a second. They were eligible to leave the camp or to be drafted into the army. So question 27, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty uh, whenever ordered? And then question 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully uh, defend the United States from any and all or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization. And a lot of people found, uh, particularly the second question, you know, they, well, this is sort of a long story, but they found it very offensive, the, the, the particularly question 28. Many of the Issei's comprising the Butte camp were tenant farmers for the San Joaquin, Santa Maria, and Los Angeles counties. Most did not own the land that they farmed or the houses they lived in. 
with the evacuation, they had lost their economic livelihoods, their homes and their families were disrupted. Now they were being asked to contribute their able-bodied sons, which was basically their retirement plan to the war effort, uh, depriving themselves of the means for their support in their old age. In Gila by uh, March 10th, about 58% of the male citizens answered question 27 uh, in the affirmative, yes, yes, uh, yes. And then about 66% uh, answered question 28 in the affirmative. 90% of the female citizens answered question 28 in the affirmative, while almost 100% of the alien Japanese answered modified versions of these two questions. Now with the arrest of 28 of the Issei and Kibe uh, uh, members of the Kibe and uh, Issei organizations by the FBI and the army and mainly the leaders, the other members conducted their activities underground. There was a very strong pocket of resistance against the, uh, Gila, among the Gila population that continued after the application leave clearance event. In Gila, the WRA and uh, military officials and many of the liberal observers, such as the uh, researchers of the UC Berkeley's Japanese evacuation and relocation study. That was a very important study headed by uh, Dorothy Thomas and uh, Charles Kikuchi was the main representative, he was the leader of the JCL and he, he was one of their research people in the camp. I used his uh, notes extensively. He wrote like 10 pages of notes uh, about what was going on in the camp uh, every day. Uh, interpreted this change in the Japanese population as a shift from active resistance to the military registration to an accommodation to this. Initially, this is what Robert Spencer, one of the uh, uh, one of the, these UC Berkeley people says initially the evacuees protested the army's program, but the community at large settled down to a peaceful acceptance of the situation. Spencer and other Jairus researchers argued that the troublemakers, and that's what they referred to, this is what they often called the, you know, the no-no people who were uh, arrested, took advantage of the poor handling of the registration by the army and the WRA and stirred up the emotions of the evacuees. And he says, as soon as these troublemakers were apprehended and removed, the evacuees came to their senses and accommodated to this program. This observation underestimates the continuation of Japanese resistance to the uh, WRA's program and the, and the army's programs. And Hayashi argues that coercion, and we're talking about those three camps, T Topaz, uh, Manzanar, and, uh, and uh, Poston. Uh, Hayashi argues in these three camps, coercion during the registration altered the rules of governance. Prior to uh, February 1943, in turn, Japanese expressed their political opinion with relatively little constraint. During the loyalty uh, registration, however, they found themselves muzzled by administrators, uh, federal government officials, and military officers who suppressed their views. In all four camps, the uh, FBI and the Army uh, presence often in, in uninvited. What's interesting about uh, Hayashi's book is he shows that like the, the Department of Military, the military had very different priorities than the social sciences studying social scientists studying the Japanese Americans in the camps, and and often they would not consult with the uh, WRA administrators, the directors of the camp. They would just come in and arrest people. And so uh, their presence and the arrest influenced the uh, internees answers to qu question 27 and 28. Uh, moreover, in Topaz and Gila, the uh, war relocation authorities accused those of, um, of uh, who answered no of being traitors. And in Topaz, the director uh, said that they would be prosecuted under the uh, Espionage Act. And you know, we hear about that today, the use of that act. And Gila, the project attorney, James Terry, told them that a no answer to question 28 is a clear admission that the uh, registrant is a traitor to this country. Pretty harsh words. These uh, evacuees either answered, uh, asked for repatriation, openly declared their loyalty 
to Japan or answered the two registration questions in the negative or gave unqualified answers uh, to these two questions. And so there were pressure in these four camps to make those who answered no change their answers to yes. And so, for example, in Gila, they would offer it like, oh, you can go, you know, you can have communication with your parents, your fathers who are in North Dakota. So that was an incentive to get them to change their answer. Anyway, when the smoke cleared, the no-nos, this group, the no-no group, uh, including the family members, comprised about 22% or more than 3,000 of the 13,000 people in, in Gila. Uh, and so the no-nos were sent to Thule Lake or to Japan, and we'll see more about this in a second. On uh, October 1st, uh, 1943, about 15% of the Gila population uh, uh, 1,915 evacuees and their family members were transferred to Thule Lake uh, Relocation Center. By the summer of 1943, 71 Helians had taken a more drastic step and decided to repatriate to Japan, and they went on this famous ship called the uh, Grephelm or, or something like that. I, if you want to know the name of the ship, I, you can email me. Uh, in the midst of this controversy over the loyalty questions, the Gila News Courier, which was edited by one of the JCL leaders, James Sakamura, was the editor. He announced, baseball at Gila will commence this Sunday afternoon as a virtually intact Guadalupe YMBA 9 encounters a strong Stockton team at the newly built uh, baseball field near Block 28. The widely known Guadalupe squad will field a well-balanced team of many uh, veterans uh, against the comparatively well unknown uh, Stockton team. And said, Guadalupe's head coach is none other than Butch Tamora, veteran catcher and former LA Wanji uh, star. And you're gonna hear in just a minute about Setsuo Aratani, who is uh, the, the big boss of Guadalupe. And he recruited Butch Tamora and his family to come to his company in Guadalupe, which was in the boonies. Guadalupe was in the boonies. But, but Mr. Uh, Aratani was a very smart promoter. And he knew that, uh, you know, since th their population was so visible in these labor camps, uh, that, uh, you know, it was time to promote good public relations. So he got Butch Tamora to come up and act as an, a, an accountant and coach for his baseball team. The newly... Uh, Built field was built through the hard efforts of Ken Zenimora, Kenichi Zenimora, who is sp supported by the community activities section. Now, this is later. This is what, 19 February 1943. Before this time, Zenimora was really carrying on a kind of guerrilla uh, activity of, of building this uh, baseball field. And this is Zenimora's field at Gila. This article is significant in three ways. It connects the YMBA sponsored by Setsuo Aratani of Guadalupe to its glorious pre-evacuation uh, history as one of the best Japanese American baseball teams in Southern California. Now this is a time when California was not part of the national leagues. They had their own Pacific Coast League. Uh, and, and, and so like the uh, San Francisco, what were they called, the Seals, I think. And then the, uh, San Diego Padres were part of this. This was a like an A uh, team league. And then so the uh, Guadalupe Produce League was really a B team. They were like a semi-pro. They were a B team uh, at the time. Anyway, the YMBA, uh, which was the second team sponsored by Setsuo Aratani, it was actually sponsored by the Buddhist uh, minister, uh, Moto Fuji. But, you know, Aratani was the money behind it. Uh, anyway, it, it connects... Uh, the Aratani team, uh, the YMBA, uh, glorious pre-evacuation history is one of the best Japanese American baseball teams in Southern California. It defeated the top teams of the Japanese Athletic Union of Southern California in four out of five contests. The Olivers in 1933, the San Pedro Skippers twice in 1935, and the San Fernando Aces in 1938. Secondly, it not only courted, accorded celebrity status to Butch Tamori, but it connected him to the wider Southern California Nisei community rather than just to Guadalupe. And finally, it legitimized 
Kenichi Zenimura's efforts to build the baseball field near um, Block 28, where he lived. And this is really his building the field was a kind of act of resistance. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, um, so basically, the Santa Maria Valley was developed like mu much of the land in, in uh, California. Uh, a lot of banks took over the uh, Mexican land grants, the Mexican and Spanish land grants. And Guadalupe was one of the land grants. It was taken over by the Leroy brothers. There was a bank. Uh, and, and then they turned it over to uh, Japanese laborers. They recruited Japanese laborers to grow sugar beets. So the, the, um, the um, labor contractors uh, eventually, so, so like when I went through the census, like for 1900, 1910, there were these large Japanese labor camps and they were headed, it would say like Otoy's camp or um, Minami's camp. And these, these guys later became the, you know, the owners of these produce companies. So these four Japanese produce companies of which Guadalupe Produce was the largest and Aratani came in late, but he, uh, apparently he made some kind of deal with the Leroy brothers to come in and farm like 5,000 acres. It was amazing. They dominated the produce industries of the valley, producing and shipping over 80% of the valley's produce. These companies created an ethnic economy, sending produce by truck to Los Angeles and San Francisco and shipping it by rail throughout the United States. They produced approximately 75% of the nation's cauliflower and most of the lettuce sold in the Los Angeles wholesale and retail markets. And there's the four Japanese companies dominated the produce industry. You see the uh, Guadalupe Produce, which was run by Aratani and others. He had other principles as well. And then you see Minami uh, Produce Company, Minami and Sons. And then next to that is Santa Maria Produce. And that was run by the Tomokas and other people. Uh, Ken Kitasako, who was a Nisei manager. Uh, and then there's Otoy's company. So four. And there's Setsuo Aratani, the big boss. He was the largest grower in Guadalupe in the whole valley and the coach of two winning baseball teams. And he was really, like I said, he was a promoter. I mean, the Rafu Shimpo, the main uh, newspaper, Japanese American newspaper in LA, constantly referred to him as a promoter. And he was, you know, he was very, you know, he knew that the Japanese. Uh, labor camps were very visible and particularly, uh, you know, not the, the, you know, the elites of Santa Barbara and Montecito were not happy about having uh, these labor camps. So he knew that he had to really have a public relations uh, strategy and a very smart man. And here's his first team. Before the YMBA, he sponsored the Aratani Nine, or he called it the Guadalupe Produce Nine. And they won, like I said, there were these B, uh, Team, there were these leagues of B team, of B teams. So there was a Coast League Mission. I think that must be uh, Mission Coast League. I might have had that wrong. Mission Coast League, I think, is actually the name. But anyway, his team won the pennant in 1937, 38, and 39. And he probably he would have won 1930, but the for some reason uh, the final game he wasn't able. They weren't able to play it. I don't know if it was some, a result of some racial incident or what so he was a big uh baseball fan and promoter and had you know logos all over his uh the, his shipping crates and he took this team to japan uh this interracial uh, guadalupe produce team members played and won 16 out of 20 games with japanese college teams and this is when uh baseball was not popular in japan at this time it was just a university sport and so they played uh, these teams. Later on, Zenimura would arrange for Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig to go play in uh, in Japan and made Jap the Japanese baseball crazy. Now here, this is the 1933 Guadalupe YMBA team. They defeated the Olivers 16 to, uh, I'm sorry, 11 to 16 at the Guadalupe field. But they also found that they were part of a wider community. Now, if you look at this picture, I wish I had gotten these uh, people identified. But you see the big shots off, you know, on the top uh, slide. You see them off to the left. And then you see the Wanjis, uh, Butch, Butch, Butch Tamora's team. And then you see the Olivers, which was a Christian. They were a Christian team. And, and they, the Olivers was a club that was organized by a school teacher. To, to bring 
uh, discipline to the young kids so they wouldn't become juvenile delinquents. So it's, it's kind of interesting. But anyway, and then Guadalupe is on the right. At the, you know, you have all the Guadalupe team members. And that's probably Setsuo Aratani there. I, in fact, I think it is, yes, that's Setsuo Aratani there among his players. Anyway, so that's that's the team. So they've realized that they were part of a wider community. These kind of uh, pictures really are worth a thousand, more than a thousand words. Now here's the uh, 1935 championship. They claimed the, the championship in 1935. And interestingly, there is George Aratani, the son of Setsuo Aratani. And he set the next day he sailed to Japan to go to Keio University, which is kind of interesting. So Kenichi Zenimura, the dean of baseball, Japanese-American baseball, and I use this term from Kerry Nakagawa's book. I, I mean, I'm borrowing rather uh, heavily, but I think it's an excellent book, and I totally recommend you reading it. I'll, I'll tell you the title in a minute. Anyway, Zenimura, who resided in Fresno before and after World War II, had a major, was a major promoter of Japanese-American baseball in California and Japan and coached and played uh, on Fresno and all-star Japanese American teams that played against Aratani's Produce Nine and later the Guadalupe YMBAs. Um, and that means young men of Buddhist America, many times before the war. Uh, Zeni Mora, bitter that he'd been separated from his team, which had been sent to Jerome Relocation Center and refusing to unpack his suitcase he probably, as an act of resistance against his situation, began to build a baseball field near his home in Block 28 in the Butte camp of the, the Gila River Relocation Center. And it was a kind of grassroots movement, as we will see. His son describes it very well. This is Zenny Mora, the dean of uh, Japanese American baseball. And as I said, in the early 30s, he arranged for Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth to tour Japan, making baseball incredibly popular in Japan, which is still to this day. I mean, that's their number one game. And whereas, you know, nowadays, uh, it's funny, like they, they interviewed this historian of, of football and he came in and said, well, baseball was then, football is now. Well, you know, I disagree with that. And I've been watching the Ken Burns series on baseball and I think it's excellent. I just watched the 10th episode and someone says, you know, baseball is history. And it is, you know, and that's why I think it's so relevant that, the, you, know, the, you know, that we look at baseball in the Gila camp. Anyway, this is what uh, Howard Zenimore, the son of, um, of uh, Ken, says, right near our block was an open space. So we started digging out the sagebrush with shovels. Pretty soon people came by to ask us what we were doing. We told them that we were building a ballpark and that then everybody was out there with their shovels clearing the space. So here we have a popular movement starting out. Uh, the agricultural division load, loaned them a bulldozer eventually. But before that time, uh, uh, Howard, the, the son of uh, Kenichi, uh, explains that they appropriated lumber for the backstop behind home base. The fence that surrounded the camp was built of four by fours strung with barbed wire. So we just took enough to build a frame for the backstop. We needed lumber. We were in block 28 and the lumber yard was way across the other side of the camp. We'd go there in the middle of the night and get the lumber, lug it all the way uh, out in the sagebrush, bury it in the desert and go back and pick it up when we needed it. They probably knew, he's talking about the, you know, the camp personnel, the WRA personnel, probably knew what was going on, but nobody said anything. Meanwhile, the acting uh, project director of Gila, uh, Mr. Cozen, was pleading with the residents of, of Gila to stop pilfering lumber from the government stockyard. However, by February 25th, 1943, as the above article states, Zenimora was supported by the community activities section. So he won support from the camp and, uh, government. And Brian Nia uh, argues from the point of view of the internment camp administrators, uh, sports activities were important because they provided wholesome activity to alleviate boredom, bored, boredom which it was, was feared could lead to serious trouble if left unchecked, and particularly since there was so much resentment out there about the loyalty questions. On the other hand, for the internees themselves, sportsmen is an enjoyable way to pass the time. 
a link to pre-war communities and a means of maintaining at least one aspect of Japanese American culture in the desolate, in the desert. As my study of Japanese Americans in Santa Barbara County and Kerry Nakagawa's show in his wonderful book, I told you I'd tell you about his book, Through a Diamond, 100 Years of Japanese American Baseball. Baseball was deeply rooted in Japanese American culture before the war, before, during, and after. It also transcended many of the language and cultural barriers before, before, between the Isseis and Niseis. And there is the famous Lou Gehrig and uh, Lou Gehrig, Ken Zenimora in the middle, right, uh, third from the left, and then Babe Ruth on his side, 1927. Baseball was very important in the Japanese American community before, during, and after the war, as we will see here. Now, this there's a, an, a very interesting master's thesis by James Statler. He looks at baseball at the Thule Lake, the place where the so-called troublemakers were sent. Uh, and he argues that... Uh, uh, baseball was seen by Nisei leaders, people like James Sakamoto, who was the leader up in Seattle. He was an editor of the Seattle Courier, which is a Japanese-American newspaper. And then George Nakamura, who's one of the JACL leaders in Los Angeles and was uh, uh, editor of the Rafu Shimpo, which is the main uh, newspaper, was, uh, was far more important than entertainment because it provided an alternative discourse to the anti-Japanese sentiment and legal discrimination before the war. It provided an arena in which one of my interviewees says, people are judged by what they do, not who they are, not by the color of their skin. The Guadalupe had, YMBA had an outstandingly successful season in Gila in 1943, winning the center's championship series and defeating uh, a number of uh, outside, a few outside teams, non-Japanese teams. Uh, and then a team from Heart Mountain Relocation Center, the famous zebras uh, or Asahis from San Jose. Uh, they were called the Asahi uh, um, of San Jose before that. And then when they came to the internment camp, they changed their name uh, to zebras, recognizing their prisoner-like status. And we'll talk about them in just a minute. Many of the YMBA team members who answered no, no to the loyalty questions were sent to uh, Tule Lake Internment Center, where they won the 1944 uh, Tule Lake uh, Championship. However, first I want to discuss James Statler's excellent study of baseball at the Tule Lake Internment Center and compare it to baseball at Gila. So Statler describes a very polarized, kind of like our politics of today, series of contests at the Tule Lake over the meaning of baseball. For JCL leaders like um, Sakam, uh, let me go back. Like, uh, oh, like James Sakamoto and George Nak Nak uh, Nakamura, who are JCL leaders. So. Uh, so the JACL leaders thought that baseball was really about sportsmanship and following the rules of the game and showing good citizenship, not challenging the empire's decision and supporting the American war effort. While the angry pro-Japanese Issei, Kibe, and Nisei did everything they could to undermine this dominant discourse at the internment uh, camp. The pro-Japanese Kibe uh, Issei and Niseis ultimately shut down baseball at Gila Lake by the middle of 1945 season, since the umpires were too afraid to preside over the unruly games and often ended in free-for-all fistfights. Well, apparently, uh, Gila was no different, and the uh, editor of the uh, Gila Courier uh, warned the Gila internees, uh, we are alarmed by the rowdiness, discourtesy, and unsportsmanlike conduct that some residents exhibit. And he talks about how that's going to influence the young people to become, uh, you know, uh, bicker, bickers and, and booers. So wanting gent gentlemanly like uh, behavior. So the sportsmanship uh, will pay. That's what the uh, Nakamura is saying. The uh, Butte All-Stars played against a, a, a non-Japanese game, the, 
the uh, Casa Grande El Royal uh, uh, game tomorrow. So he wants them to be on their best behavior. And the uh, All-Stars defeated the uh, Casa Grande team by 20 to uh, 3. However, baseball at Gila was definitely a different kind of game than it was at the Tule Lake Relocation Center. It took a life of its own beyond the political debate between the JACL and the uh, um, War Relocation Authority supporters and the opposition. In the Butte camp, the best teams were Zinni Moore's Block 28, Pasadena, and the Guadalupe YMBA, which had been a B team before the war. During the 43 season, uh, between April uh, 4 to August 7th, the YMBA played 20 league games, winning 14, losing four, and had two ties. The YMBA team won the first half of the league. The Pasadena won the second half, and the y, uh, Guadalupe YMBA, in a tournament of three out of five games, defeated Pasadena in the first three games. The team members became the champions of Butte Camp. Okay, then this is when the zebras were brought over from the Heart Mountain Relocation Center. There was an air of anticipation, the Courier uh, reported, as Zenny Moore and, and Harry Kono was another famous promoter for the for Alameda, negotiated to have the zebras of, uh, you know, like I said, formerly of San Jose, uh, they became the, the um, um, they, they wore the size and they became the zebras when they, um, you know, reflecting their pr prisoner-like status from Heart Mountain Relocation Center to play in the uh, Guadalupe YBMBA in, in Gila. So they came from Heart Mountain to Gila to play. Uh, on August 28th, the Gila News Courier announced zebras to compete here, expected Tuesday, um, and they talk about how the game was arranged. Courier also noted that the zebras had captured Heart Mountain Center's six-team league with five straight wins. So also a very good game, uh, team. And the Courier announced on August 31st that the YMBA had stopped Hinagas, the manager of the uh, Asahi's team, three to two. The uh, San Jose Zebras Asahi's praised Gila's sportsmanship and hospitality. So it seems like the Courier had some impact on the, um, the people of, of, uh, of Gila. In the Heart Mountain Sentinel, uh, Sentinel, in his column, Sports Tidbits, Jack Kunitomo wrote, the players, the Zebras, were unanimous in their approval of the sportsmanship and hospitality shown by the players at Gila. The Zebras retreated like royal guests. The Asahi players raved that the best team, best game of the series was with the Guadalupe Nine, winners of the Gila Baseball League. The Asahi's uh, heartbreaking loss, three to two, this game drew a crowd of 5,000. And that was very common, like 5,000 people would come to these baseball games in uh, Gila. That was the main thing to do in the Butte camp. Uh, the YMBA also took the Gila championship in a three out of five series against the Canal Camp Rough Riders, uh, winning three out of five of the games. And there's the Gila champs of 1943. Zinni Mora's role as the Dean of Japanese American Baseball, as Kerry Nakagawa calls him, uh, might have prevented the polarization that developed at Tule Lake, as, Strat, uh, as Statler depicts it. Uh, at the end of the 43 season, Zinni Mora and WRA officials Hoffman and uh, Walter arranged a game with the semi-pro Euro-American team, uh, the Thunderbirds. Uh, oh, we got 10 more minutes. Uh, uh, the <clears throat> the uh, editor uh, of the uh, News Courier, uh, you know, is hoping, gives an example of Zenny Mora winning over the uh, hearts and minds of, uh, this is when uh, Zenny Mora lived in Fresno, winning over the hearts and minds of the people of Livingston, which is a town near Fresno, by playing baseball. Uh, at first, Livingston had put anti-Japanese signs but after playing a few baseball games, the signs disappeared. Zenny Mora managed baseball in Gila as a business enterprise as well as a community resource. According to his uh, son, his father drew uh, lines on the seats and put numbers. Anybody that donated a lot of money would get a good seat. 
He reported the costs and earnings for the games in the news courier. So it's very much a kind of democratic participatory uh, activity. On September 28, 1943, the news courier announced that tomorrow is Guadalupe Day. This is when the Japanese Americans from Guadalupe are going to be shipped to Tule Lake in a, in a few days. All proceeds minus expenses will be given to the champs, the Guadalupe YMBA. This was a time when people from Guadalupe were being relocated to Tule Lake. In the all-star game that followed, Guadalupe YMBA allied with a, a, a beat, with the canal team, and, um, and 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 these guys made up the no nos and yes yeses teams. Uh, baseball also served to minimize uh, the tensions between the Issei's the Issei's over the loyalty questions. On uh, in September 1943, the month before the no nos were to be sent to segregated. Uh, and, and to be sent to and segregated at the Tule Lake Relocation Center. Zinni Mora arranged a three-game series between some of the best players from uh, the Guadalupe team and, and some of the other players and had a, a no-no versus yes-yes uh, series of three, of three games. In the first game, the yes-yes down the no-nos four to five. The second game, the no-nos down the yes-yes seven to five. After the two-game uh, series, they decided to cancel the third game, that they were kind of just best off as they were, which is interesting. Uh, and this is what the uh, uh, the news courier says. Uh, Buttes, Yes Yes, and No No Nines split one apiece in their series over the weekend. The Thule bound uh, squad lost out Saturday four, five to four, but came back to take the second tilt seven to five Sunday night. It was decided not to hold the third game uh, of the last night. All in all, the classic, classic, the novel classic ended seemingly just right, being called with one win apiece. The news courier observed in an editorial entitled Time to Part, this is when the people are being sent to Tule Lake, that it was not a matter of loyalty versus disloyalty that separated the two groups. Parting comes hard to people who have become good com comrades through sharing the good and bad as intimately and generally as we have. Your departure was made necessary by the circumstances. The terms loyalty and disloyalty have been tossed around indiscriminately, but we know that they are not the primary factors in most cases. In a deep, it is a deep need for security and for consistency, which prompted you to decide as you have. So there's this great understanding he's uh, extending to the no-nos. And a lot of the no-nos wanted to be with their families. That's why they answered no, no. Not, not that they were against the United States or whatever. The editor concluded that even though their paths will diverge for now, they will eventually merge. Now, compare this to uh, Heart Mountain Sentinel. In contrast, Bill uh, Hasekawa, uh, a JCL leader, took a very uncompromising view towards a no-no at Heart Net Mountain. He argued... Thus, a man is considered either loyal or disloyal. There can be no in-between where the fate of nations is at stake. At stake. He also welcomed the yes, yes people from Tule Lake since there is a similarity of interests and loyalties be between us, which augurs well for the future. So basically, goodbye to the no-nos. Uh, during the 1944 season at Tule Lake, meanwhile, most of the Guadalupe uh, YMBA players went to Tule Lake, where during the 1944 season, they won every uh, uh, game in the Taishoyo League, um, every game. They had 100%. And, and um, the uh, news courier covered them, even though they were in Tule Lake. And the news courier said, with Step Tomoka pitching the, his ex-Helian mates to seven straight wins, the Guadalupe nine finished the regular season with a clean slate 100 percent record he also noted that the other championship at Tule was a former Gila team as well here's the guadalupe ymba Tule lake champs 1944 there's the Tule lake baseball field and these pitchers were from uh masa o iriyama who was part of the uh ymba team there's a Tule lake audience uh, at a baseball game and there's a 1945 season so I'm going to skip to this to get to the takeaway here. Takeaway, baseball at Gila and Tule Lake. 
On one hand, baseball could lessen tensions between opposing sides, reinforcing good sportsmanship, behavior, etc. cetera. Uh, among Zenny Morris Athletic uh, Grassroots Movement at Hilo Relocation Center. On the other hand, it could be an arena in which a wider conflict was enacted as between pro-Japanese versus pro-American factions of uh, Tule Lake. But more subtly, baseball could provide a pathway, both mentally and spiritually for Japanese Americans, connecting them to their past, like, like the Guadalupe before the war, and their, to their future. Japanese Americans made up one third to a half of the members in the Santa Maria uh, High uh, School's baseball clubs after the war. And this is really important. Uh, after the war, um, these um, the Sheehy brothers who were uh, um, strawberry farmers would come to, during the war, they would come to the Santa Maria Valley and start farm, farming strawberries. And after the war, they would bring in people they had farmed before the war in Monterey County. They would bring in Japanese Americans from Monterey County who were in Poston. So some kind of deal was struck where um, the elites in the Santa Maria Valley did not want the Japanese who had been there before the war to come back. So, but they were willing to make a deal with the strawberry farmers to let them bring in Japanese Americans from Gila. So it's actually significant that, you know, the people, um, not Gila, but from Poston. So it's quite significant that these Japanese Americans would make up most of the uh, baseball team at, at San Maria High. Uh, Brian Hayashi's excellent book, on fo which focuses on the politics of governance of those three camps, uh, uh, Topaz, uh, Poston, and uh, Manzanar, uh, he focused on the older leadership, the, the Kibe, the Isseis, and the uh, tension between the JCL and the non JCL older Niseis. But in looking at baseball in Gila, we can also appreciate the concerns of the younger Niseis who made up much of the population after the middle of 1943. And what's interesting is Zenny Mora, just to look at these younger people, organized a team in 1944. He organized a junior team with his two sons and Tetsuo uh, Furukawa, who's a good friend of mine, and I hope he's listening today, or uh, anyway, who turned me on to this wonderful story. Uh, the old the uh, Gila All-Star Juniors defeated the Heart Mountain All-Stars in a championship game fought at Heart Mountain, nine out of 13 games. Then on April 4th, 1945, the Butte High School Eagles defeated the Badgers, which was the Arizona's top uh, uh, high school team of, made up of Euro-Americans, Euro which was had won the championship in 1943, 1944, in 1945, and here's what happens. This is what Fru Mr. Furukawa remembers, that the two teams got together where Zenny Moore, this is after the game, lived after the game and were eating watermelon. The Euro-American members of the Tucson High Badgers wanted to do some sumo wrestling. They made a ring and we pushed each other around for a while. They planned a rematch in Tucson. After that, uh, Tucson coach Hank Slagle drove the yellow bus, they jumped in the bus, and they went to Tucson, but they were in for a big surprise. When they got back to Tucson, the people's response was, and I, you know, these are his words, you son of a bitches, losing to a bunch of Japs. They had to cancel the second game, but what's really interesting, despite the racism here, there was a kind of bond of mutual respect between the two coaches and possibly between the team members, uh, among the team, team members. However, despite the racist response of the people of Tucson to their local high school uh, loss to the Japanese American Butte High Stars. We can see that this game created a sense of mutual respect between the two coaches and possibly among the members of the two teams. And this is what Zinni Mora wrote to uh, Coach Slagle. It was a great disappointment to myself and to the members of the Butte baseball team when we heard the cancellation of our return game. The war has created many unpleasant incidences I can only hope that in, in due time, the differences in opinion can be overcome and that we may be able to resume our athletic rivalry. And then this is what Slagle wrote back to Zenny Mora. We share your disappointment in not being able to play your return game on our field. We were not only anxious to avenge the defeat, but enjoyed the heads up smart competition you could give. Your brand of ball was right down our alley. Mixed me metaphor there, but that's okay. And the boys, could gain much from your heads up, base running, and infield play. Okay, that's it. 
that's my presentation. Any questions? Well, they're going to move us into the other room here in a second. Okay, I guess that's what. We're at four o'clock and uh, we one hour. One hour. That's great, Dr. Howden. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we We're give you a chance to catch your breath after that uh, informative presentation. We're Again? Right sure. Hello? No, we're right here. I'm here. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I sorry. I was thanking I you for the presentation and trying yeah. to give you a time to catch your breath after being so uh, yeah. educational and informative. Thanks again. I'm absolutely. Um, happy. I'll, I'll yeah. take any questions. I'm happy. I'll check and see. Um, while, while we check and see if there are any questions, um, I'd like to make a couple of comments about the, about the presentation, right? Um, I was really struck by the divisiveness of the, the, um, the loyalty questions right uh yes. the community almost divided what 60 40 or so yeah. uh, on on yes or no on the on each question and right. um and but i i really appreciated how baseball right the sportsmanship of it and the the sense of fair play right how it kind of brought those teams together and gave them another level of of, of community mindedness right i think that was a strong theme in your talk and um, something, something we can that, learn from today something yes. we can learn from today Absolutely. You know, we're so polarized. I mean, people aren't going out and getting vaccinations when it's totally against their mm -hmm. self-interest not to do so. You know, because mm -hmm. they listen to some. You know, we're a spectator culture. You know, they listen to some. You know, mm -hmm. uh, talking head on Fox News or whatever, and they decide, well, I'm not getting a vaccination. I'm too <laughs> masculine for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that. It does have application to today. You know, I mean, I guess that's a theme in in in, in all of history. Um, yeah, how how politics, how leaders can divide communities, you know, and um, we saw that in 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 the camps as well. We had one camp that was really strong, you know, pro pro loyalty and pro American government, and then another camp that was more more measured in in their uh, reaction right. as well. Yeah. And one of the things that Brian Hayashi shows in his book, he, he has mm -hmm. a whole section on what he calls the quiet period. And when mm -hmm. people are being relocated to Thule, like he mm -hmm. found that basically there's no difference between those who stayed mm -hmm. and those who left. M major difference mm -hmm. was property ownership. People mm -hmm. that you know um, that own property tended to answer yes, yes. Those ah. who didn't own property answered no. You know they figured, well, I'll just go back to Japan. And of course, I interviewed people who went back to Japan. You know, after the war, they had a uh -huh. terrible time in Japan. Japan was so poor. They were starving, and you know, people had a terrible time. Yeah, yeah, that came out in one of our former presentations, uh, a film we had. Uh, people who returned, who were repatriated to, to, to Germany um, uh, during the war, right, had a terrible time and came back as soon as they could after the war. Um, so I'm interested in, in your research, and uh, yeah, you had access to people in the camps who had spent time in the camps, or their jet children. Who were able to help you with their notes? I noticed you had a uh, Ken Ken uh, Nishimura's son help you. It's any more. Um, son. Yeah. It's more. I'm sorry. Actually, Sanimura's that was son. from an art. There was an interview. Mm -hmm. I took that from an article that was based on an interview with the two sons. So oh, that was. Okay. But but mm -hmm. most of my research was done at the Bancroft mm -hmm. Library at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and I went through all the social scientists. Uh, descriptions of what was going on in the camp, and that meant mm -hmm. reading these kind of on onion paper. You know, these you know everything was in mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. reading, you know, lots of times it'd be kind of smeared, so I'd spend mm -hmm. hours reading these papers. Mm -hmm. Then I went out and interviewed the people. I, so I went and lived. I lived down in in Santa Maria, Santa Barbara, for a right. couple for a couple of years and interviewed people all the time. I mean, it got to be, you know, uh, a ritual. You know, I'd call them up and mm -hmm. I'd say, mm -hmm. "Well, when are you coming over?" You know, it's nice. And Tetsuo Furukawa, my good friend, he's 95 mm -hmm. now, and, mm -hmm. and I hope and I wish him the best. I just want to say mm -hmm. that. I wish, like, I'm really greatly indebted to people who helped me translate Japanese. So mm -hmm. I translated mm -hmm. a lot of the Rafu Shimpo articles. Mm -hmm. And there's this lady, Masao Yamada, who helped me with the translation. Because I could read mm -hmm. enough Japanese, you know, particularly the uh, hiragana, katakana, which is really easy. But mm -hmm. the, the, the names of like strikes and places were in hiragana and katakana uh, mm -hmm. and, and 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 japanese speakers today cannot read these mm. you know, old japanese so i took him to this elderly lady and i paid mm -hmm. her to translate them for me she was very helpful so uh mm -hmm. 
uh, heads up to uh, uh, to um, Mrs. Uh, Yamada. And also my ex-wife, uh, mm -hmm. B.A. Ota, helped me translate mm -hmm. a lot of this. And I guess that's why she's now my ex-wife. <laughs> I took advantage of that. I'm sorry about that. You mentioned your research and you mentioned your dissertation. I would like to tell our viewers that we do have a copy in our library system of, the, of your dissertation. So we get it on the camera. It's all, as you see, 600 pages of it. It's at the Santa Maria Public Library. It is a reference item, so you would have to read it in the library. But I know Dr. Dr. Helen is working on a book, which is a, not an excerpt, but is a, a, a reduced version uh, mm -hmm. of the, his research into the Japanese American families in, in uh, Santa Barbara County. Um, he also mentioned Vanished by, uh, by um, which has an, uh, an introduction by him, but by John McReynolds, which we do have copies at the Solvang and Buellton Library. It's a fascinating book. It buy documents it. stories. Buy I'm sorry. Please. Oh, yeah. Please tell them to buy it. I mean, you can buy it. For oh, just, well, you, know, well, you can also yeah, buy it. I'm sure it's on Amazon. Help project. Right? Help but, uh, well, we are a public library, so we like people to borrow our books as well. Um, yeah, so um, that's available and it has some fascinating stories uh, and factual um, essays or short interviews with um, people who were uh, Lompoc Japanese Americans. Yeah, I, I can't mm -hmm. emphasize enough that he really salvaged that community because mm -hmm. only like a couple of families came back, but he was mm -hmm. able to bring together in writing that book all these people. I mean, I think he started a website and everything. So mm -hmm. he brought all these people together who had known each other before the war, but they had been scattered, which mm -hmm. was the WRA, the War Relocations Authority. You know, mm -hmm. they wanted to scatter Japanese Americans and the Japanese Americans, hey, we want to be with our friends in our community. You well, know, and so the Santa Maria people, Mm -hmm. uh, it was a struggle after the war for them to come back. It was Mr. Minami came back and mm -hmm. he had a, a couple hundred acres of really bad land and he had to develop that, that acreage. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and he basically was cheated by mm -hmm. um, a company, Puritan Rice, who Puritan Ice, that had mm -hmm. been their allies and they formed a, 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 a company, joint company, with the four large growers, shippers that you saw in that, you know, you mm -hmm. saw the packing sheds. Mm -hmm. formed a partnership, and then they cheated them out of their money. So they ended up getting like 15 cents on the dollar. So there's a whole story there. So you know, when my book is finished, mm -hmm. you can read it. Yeah, we well, we will certainly. We'll have it in the copy in the library. Um, yeah, that that reminds me of uh, Dr. Endo, Russell Endo. He had a, a pre presented to us too as well, and he mentioned the Farmers Association in uh, Northern Santa Barbara County that really exploited the uh, Japanese Americans and uh, give them cents on the dollar for their land, actually, right. when, they, when they left. But bringing up, you know, speaking of the camps, I, 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 you mentioned the uh, Berkeley Study Group, right? And the right. role of social scientists in right. the actual running of the camps, right? right. And I thought that was interesting that they, there was actual, um, uh, not, I don't want to say manipulation, but an actual effort to, um, to, to socially uh, uh, what's the word? You you so use the word engineer. in your presentation. Engineer. engineer. I'm sorry. That's it. Thank you. The engineer. Um, how the Japanese interacted, how they ran the camps, right? And a study to see how they can apply those those uh, those uh, techniques elsewhere. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That that was a, a, a that was very interesting, and I'm sure it's something that um that uh, could do with uh, more exploration. You know, uh, ultimately. Yeah, so uh, Hayashi shows how like some of the scientists went to Japan during the colonization, you know, the mm -hmm. occupation until mm -hmm. 1952, the occupation mm -hmm. of Japan, and they, you know, they were governor governors of man of men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they can uh, it on. Yeah, it's, it's a very important book, it's, but I just have mm -hmm. to warn you, it's hard to read. Like when he talks uh, about nice. the three camps, he'll, mm -hmm. yeah, what 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 he's trying to do, and that's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to do is to get a lot mm -hmm. of text. Mm -hmm. Into mm -hmm. a few pages, right? That's Ooh, what that is dense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's very dense. So, in one paragraph, mm -hmm. he'll talk about all three camps, mm -hmm. and he kind of assumes that you know who all these social scientists are and what camp mm -hmm. they're in. Mm -hmm. And so, I had, I had like color code everything to be able to read. <laughs> and I've been—I mean, I, I know Brian Hayashi. I used to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. do research with him in Bancroft Library. Mm -hmm. a very excellent scholar. I have total respect. For his work. Mm -hmm. um, you do mention quite a few scholars that you worked with and um, that you quote in your in your presentation. 
Um, would you like to recommend some of those books uh, by title or to, to, to our viewers? So, the, well, the, the, Terry mm -hmm. Na the Carrie Nakagawa book, which it's in mm -hmm. the other book, but, that I'll have to, but there's, this is mm -hmm. Friday Hayashi's book, Democracy mm -hmm. and the Enemy, mm -hmm. uh, Japanese Americans Internment, that's mm -hmm. that one. And I, I, I can tell you, that's about the only graphic you get besides print. <laughs> you, you about, it. Yeah, if you complain about all my, you know, all my text, uh, you're going to really have a problem with Brian. But I think his book is excellent. Mm -hmm. And then another one is uh, Lon Kuroshige. And this is mm -hmm. his study, Japanese American Celebration and Conflict. And what he does mm -hmm. is he shows how the uh, um, there's an alliance between the elite Issei's and the JCL in, in uh, Los Angeles, and how they covered mm -hmm. the uh, Japanese Americans before the war, and, mm -hmm. and and particularly how they did it through the Nisei mm -hmm. Festival, the Nisei Festival, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that was a you know important event, and and it would be mm -hmm. orchestrated like those baseball games, you know, like okay, we ah. want championship, that's mm -hmm. bad behavior, those are rowdies, and mm -hmm. and it's all with this kind of eye mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. appeasing the white dominant mainstream society very much mm -hmm. so and mm -hmm. and and Kuroshige starts off by mm -hmm. criticizing the model minority myth and, mm -hmm. and there's a reason why even before it came became the model minority myth and by the way mm -hmm. it became the model minority myth thanks to this guy named Peterson who is a professor at Cal and he mm -hmm. basically had this argument like you know he was against the civil rights movement and it's like look at the Japanese they're quiet they mm -hmm. do the uh, why why are all these Latinos and and, and blacks mm -hmm. out there you know, agitating, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. then he, and he wrote an interesting article. I can't remember if it was in Time Magazine or the other, um, the, um, the other one. Uh, Newsweek. Mm -hmm. Newsweek, yeah. That, it was mm -hmm. in one of those ma magazines. And it was definitely, mm -hmm. he, that's where he introduced the concept of the model minority myth. That's mm -hmm. in a very, that's what kind of really worked out as a way to, you know, offset the, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Before the war, it was just mm -hmm. mainly appealing to the dominant white, Mm -hmm. media, media yes. and uh, uh, officialdom. Yes, yes. Which which reminds me, speaking of, you know, uh, before the war, um, there was a, a, a baseball, uh, that, that B League, right, in California, right, uh, among the Japanese Americans, right? You do mention some, some games that were played with Euro Americans as well. Yes. So, yeah. uh, so were, were the leagues interracial or were they um, separate leagues? Or? Well, it, it was a time of segregation. So like the Blacks yeah, League. Were, mm -hmm. Now in the case of the Japanese Americans mm -hmm. in California, mm -hmm. they played against the, the B teams, you know, a white, you know, the Euro American B teams. B -teams. Yeah. I see. Uh, yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks. There's, there's definitely an element of segregation there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of, Baseball sort of transcended that. And the whole idea of Babe Ruth coming down to Fresno and playing with yes. us anymore, mm -hmm. isn't that amazing? It I is mean, amazing. I mean, it probably mm -hmm. was part of it, just Babe Ruth was always broke. I mean, he made lots of money, but he spent it just as quickly. But it also you know, points mm -hmm. to a kind of democratic side of baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, you can right. play, you know. I mean, even That's though it was right. segregated mm -hmm. on the national level. I mean, Blacks, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Ken Burns' series mm -hmm. on baseball is excellent. It is so good. I recommend that to you know to people who want to find out about mm -hmm. the history of baseball. Yeah, so so, so heard yes. in, in yeah. American history. Yes. Um, well, um, we have a comment from a, a viewer, Michelle Wilcox. Oh yeah, that's says, my, she's a friend of mine. <laughs> she's uh, an interested party, but that's great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Holland, for sharing this important and seldom acknowledged part of history. Well, thank you, Michelle. I'm glad you're watching. It makes us all worthwhile. I hope my daughter's out there, Carrie Holden. Uh, you know, well, she's viewing. Um, there is a in terms of making comments, people have to log in to their YouTube uh, account, okay, or their Facebook account, if they want to make a comment. So I um, just so that angled, might be an issue for some people. Mm -hmm. So I just angled this so you can see this uh, mm -hmm. uh, ancient woman behind me. Yes. I want to tell you a story about that. Mm -hmm. When I went to Japan with my uh, wife, we just married. Uh, her, you know, she came came from a samurai family, mm -hmm. and uh, the very elite. They were doctors in in Japan. Uh, anyway, I went to uh, Tokushima. That's one of the four islands, mm -hmm. and I went to uh, um, the, the city of Tokushima. And uh, 
her uncle is the mayor of, of the city and he, and, he, and he took me out to lunch and everything and he took me to his toy store one of the businesses he owned and one side of it was all samurai gear the mm -hmm. other side was all geisha <laughs> dolls uh -huh. and it just happened it just happened my mom loves white and blue and i saw this woman in this kimono mm -hmm. and i said well you know he said you can have anything you want i said well what about that my mom would like that and that's why i have that there just to let you know i don't look at women a japanese women or asian women as geishas or any of that kind of stuff it was just that my mom likes blue and white that's why i picked it and for years that was like one of the main things in our living room you know you come into the living room and that was it and as soon as uh, my ex-wife and i divorced Boom, mm -hmm. that was in the closet. <laughs> now it's back. So it's back and, and highlighted in your, yeah, in your highlighted. presentations. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Dr. Houghton, um, we want to thank you very much right, for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, as our viewer said, it was very educational and informative. And I'm sure our viewers uh, will benefit from, from your, your presentation. Um, sure. We will have it posted at the Galita and Santa Inez Valley Library website. Right. Um, sure. Yeah, that's uh, on our YouTube channel, right, uh, mm -hmm. as well as our website. Oh, okay. there'll be links to it from our website. So if you want to refer anybody to it, you can. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and this, as I said earlier at the beginning, is the end of our program, our Book to Action program, in which we featured um, George Takei's They Called Us Enemy, the graphic novel memoir of his time in the camps, his family and his time in the camps, right? Um, so to our viewers, a big thank you for staying with us. Uh, to, Dr. Kel, to Dr. Kent Howden, thank you so much again, right? And uh, we hope to see your book in the library as soon as it's published, right? Um, we right. don't have a copy here, or we will purchase one and put one on our shelves in all our libraries. You'll be the first library I go to when I get it published. I'll Thank give you, you my own copy, autographed. And Wonderful. I hold you to that. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you, Dr. Alden. Thank you very much. <laughs>